I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes tonight. My name is Tim. I'll be your partial moderator along with Andy Anderson. There are two rules at the college. One is no personal attacks, and the other is one fool at a time. The College Color of Complexes consists of the following format. We first have a brief announcements period, then we, our speaker will speak for however long he needs to, then we will have a question and answer period. Greetings, good evening. All right, uh, that was, uh, you probably turn it down again. I will explain in a moment why I played that. Uh, it uh, fits into the uh, theme of tonight's talk. My name is Larry Spivak. I'm president of the Illinois Labor History Society. I've been doing this for a fair number of years now. Uh, it's good to see uh, my friend uh, Peter Perogo with the good t-shirt. There he is, who's been volunteering for our organization for some time. And I had the privilege and opportunity to speak to this group a uh, number of years ago, I guess somewhere between 10 and 15 when you were meeting on Lincoln Avenue. And uh, <coughs> I think I was talking about the same thing we've been talking about for the last 150 years. Uh, why is there such disparity in economic inequality? Which, in a way, is what the Haymarket was all about. Um, when it was uh, decided that, uh, uh, I, th I think it was, uh, I don't, Charlie, I don't know, it was your idea or Stephanie's idea, our director, that the theme would be, because it was on November 11th, to talk about uh, the an anniversary of the Haymarket. Let me begin with this question. How many of you here would say that you're, if not, vi if you're not, significantly familiar, vaguely familiar with uh, the Haymarket affair, the tragedy, and all of that. So two-thirds, three-fourths of you. That means that for the one person who does it, now I have to go through the entire history. Uh, <laughs> um, I got all kind of references here, by the way. Yeah, most importantly. Vagueness is a terrible Vagueness. Vagaries. Uh, actually, in a certain sense, that's what the theme is going to be tonight. I do want to direct your attention to our uh, three, two color, three color brochure. It used to be black and white, but we've upgraded because uh, we're actually, uh, uh, despite uh, the decline of the labor movement, and maybe that speaks to why people have become more interested in labor history. It could very well be. Um, but um, we've uh, been more and more successful in getting attention for what our mission is, which is it shall be the purpose of the Illinois Labor History Society to encourage the preservation and study of labor history materials of the Illinois region and to arouse public interest in the profound significance of the past to the present. And does it even matter? Do we care? I'm not sure. I know it matters. Some of us care. The question perhaps is why more people don't. Um, but I think that goes again to what the developing theme of tonight's discussion is. Um, fake news, the legacy of Haymarket, and then uh, it also, I also want to kind of uh, introduce the idea, if it's not already understood, or perhaps some of you will challenge, and rightfully so, that I would argue that uh, democracy, as we think about democracy in America, can really only exist in a true sense if workers have the right to free association, which generally gets expressed in the concept of being in a union. Um, I still think it's interesting that we use the term trade union all the time because the idea of trades is long and lost and except for a very, it's kind of like 1904 or something when everything was, uh, unions were about craft unions and uh, before the IWW formed in Chicago in 1905. 
But um, so, so I do want to uh, kind of expand on this a little bit. And I've been developing this idea more when I give talks about unions and democracy because it challenges the precepts of a lot of people who think of unions simply as top-down organizations, which generally they are in terms of their practice, but in terms of the concept, it's a, it's a grassroots organization, and in many ways the, uh, existed, the possibility of democratic institutions, unlike most uh, um, unions have that opportunity, and often uh, this issue of fake news speaks directly to the idea of why I think um, it is a uh, seems almost as if an anachronism that unions were part of America for a period of 50 years and now it's gone and it doesn't ex they don't exist anymore because um, we all know unions are uh, um, just it's a it's a word for another word for an association and virtually every uh, wealthy person has a union to represent them as you know if you are um, uh, famous and have stature in society, you might be in uh, movies, you would, all 100% of you in Hollywood and belong to the Screen Actors Guild and uh, um, SAG-AFTRA. Um, if, even though, I usually start out by saying, what five uh, classes of work do people think of when you think of the wealthy, rich, being, having high stature? And I, every single time, in most places I speak, people say lawyers, doctors, actors, athletes, and then I got to push it a little bit and I remind people that, you know, the Trumps of the world, the CEOs and those type, um, because every single one of them have one thing in common that gave them their wealth if they didn't inherit it. Or weren't, and you get, you're, unlike politicians, the uh, mostly actors and actresses at the highest level, uh, as well as um, we know athletes, that is the creme de la creme, creme de la creme. And, um, but why is it then that what they all have in common is they all have a union to represent them. And if you are, in a, if you are an actor or you're an athlete, you also have somebody else to represent you, which is an agent. And if you are a CEO, you may belong to 20 or 30 uh, associations representing you. If you're an architect, you belong to an association. If you're an engineer, you belong to an association. What we've discovered, of course, is that organizations that, um, that People who wish to be successful generally realize that collective association is the only way to get there and to preserve that kind of uh, um, stature. And so what we have done through fake news is created a society, I, I actually don't even like the term fake news, but it's kind of this, um, it used to be propaganda, but now we use fake news, so I'll say fake news. Um, we have the fake news, the propaganda that suggests that um, uh, it, is, uh, it really has created an environment where an average working person doesn't even know that a union is available for them to be part of an organization or association to represent them. That would be the case of most workers today. And, you know, the sad news, of course, is you probably know, because I think this is a crowd that... Um, uh, despite some of the topics on uh, uh, whether the moon landing was uh, uh, real or not, uh, uh, I will come to that one. I will. Um, our, that six percent of the private sector workforce is union representation in this country, and that the overall representation of workers in this country is down to twelve percent, of which about forty percent of it is public sector. Um, and I can, we could have a discussion on that, but that may come up in questions or comments, but um, I want to continue down this path of the fake news. Why did I play the Marseillaise? Well, I think it's interesting because history is something that, I just heard a quote yesterday about history, and the, I, I don't remember exactly who said it or what it was, but I guess it doesn't really matter, right? Because that's what fake news is. <laughs> and uh, or or propaganda, and uh, um, it was that history is about the last person that said something, uh, you know, something to that effect. Well, I play the Marseillaise in part because I, as president of the Illinois Labor History Society, spent a lot of time have spent a lot of time reading about 
the events of Illinois labor history, reading some history, talking about it, engaging, and also I should add that, um, and I do have some street cred, is that I've worked for a union for 34 years. Um, I just retired uh, a month or two ago. And um, uh, I think I was in the trenches and doing the representation and understanding and thinking about what unions do. And um, uh, uh, look, I'll be the first person to say that uh, imperfection is probably the model in which we all have to operate from. And from there, perhaps we can uh, uh, improve things a little bit, if not a lot. And so um, uh, often when I talk in put my thesis statement forward that um, the only way in which we can truly have a representative democracy in this country is to have the right to associate specifically and particularly and specifically in the workplace. And I'll maybe talk a little bit more about that. And this is what the hay market was all about on this 130th anniversary, is it 1887? November 11th, 1887 was the hanging. And why not celebrate a hanging, right? So that's why we're here. Um, could have been on uh, uh, on the May uh, on May fourth when the uh, tragedy or the uh, affair took place, but uh, why not celebrate a hanging? So um, here we are. And what happened is that uh, often when the story is now told, and I've told this story, why? Because somebody told it to me. I don't even know if I read it in a citation, a book cited, which I'm going to share some books and citations and the, the stuff that people obviously make up or have bad facts on, even though they're academics. Um, uh, is that the Marciaz was supposedly what the martyrs, as they they weren't martyrs at the moment, but uh, as they marched to the gallows, were humming and singing the words and the uh, melody of the Marciaz. And whether it's myth or fact, I don't know. There have been a few plays about uh, this where that's how it starts out. You hear the music, and that's why I played it. And in fact, when we dedicated the uh, rededicated the Haymarket Martyr statue, the iconic statue, the most <laughs> sacred labor site in the world, of which I am proud to be president of the organization that holds the deed to the monument. And um, I guess that makes me the representative of all workers of the world. So I'm president of all workers, of, of the union of all workers. Wait and see. Yeah. And legacy. But the Marciades, was it sung? Well, we were a year, a little over a year ago, we were at the cemetery. Um, we were in the process of uh, trying to find what we thought was the, uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, what do we call it? The uh, uh, container. The urn? The ur no, not the urn. That's where the body is. <laughs> the creek. creek. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the time capsule. There was, there was, there was a, some research that led us to believe, and I think there is, a time capsule buried at the Haymarket. We had experts, you know, in ground penetrating radar, and we found stuff, and we had archaeologists, and and, you know, digging in a professional manner only to find something that we had to rebury because it may very well have been the remains of somebody, possibly Oscar uh, Neve, we're not sure, but that could have been the case. And, uh, but it, it very, may very well have been a time capsule, but we just chose not to open it in respect for the idea that if you don't know, you don't open it because it's not proper to. I mean, that's what uh, anthropologists uh, and archaeologists told us, and so and others. But we, um, uh, you know, how is it that 125 years goes by, 130, and people have different stories? How is it possible that we stood in the same room, listening to a conversation, walk away, believing somebody said something that somebody else believes wasn't what was said? So how can we even interpret history, or how can we define history? How can we? Uh, oh, okay. Well, competition. Um, we one bottle each. We hope that we sometimes have facts. Um, and to, to support what we believe. But it turns out the research on this time capsule and other things led to more research, and I, I was challenged when I started talk, would talk at the monument about the uh, sculptor designed this based on the French Revolution. It's not exactly clear if that's the case. 
And so I find that I sometimes repeat things that somebody said that, well, it's not exactly true. So uh, going back to the ha hanging of the martyrs, um, the fiction, uh, of course, at the time, uh, and maybe I will refresh a few of your memories about what and why there was a, a, a hanging uh, that resulted in what um, our um, <clears throat> Uh, the person who chaired the meeting, I'm sorry, uh, where did you go? Um, uh, read the statement about Haymarket uh, may have been the single most influential event uh, in Illinois history uh, for workers, if not the world. In social history, it may very well be. That's arguable. I would make that argument that that is the case. But something like that, and yet, um, what really occurred at that time. We know some facts and some things we don't know, but what we do know is that uh, the men who were uh, brought to trial were not wild-eyed, uh, long-haired, creepy, um, uh, bomb-throwing individuals. Right. And the closest one to it was the German carpenter, 24 years old, who died in prison, uh, which, the uh, again, we talk about myth, we talk about um, propaganda or fake news, was that Lewis Ling killed himself. But if you look at the facts of what happened, it makes much less sense that he killed himself, much more sense that he was a, um, he, he was murdered in prison, if you look just the night before the hanging. He was one of the five men who were uh, 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 ultimately, after the commutation of two sentences and the uh, eighth guy getting 15 years in prison, um, he was one of the five who were going to hang, but he dies the night before by a bomb, a, a dynamite cap in a, in a cigar. Um, uh, so what, you know, no note, what man is going to hang but decide to blow off half of his face and suffer for, uh, you know, 12 hours to death. Um, and. Uh, it, we, you know, this is will probably be debated into perpetuity, but uh, I would argue that he was uh, not a victim of suicide, but he was a, I, but he was a, uh, a victim of murder by the corporate agenda, the police, um, which was the system that per perpetuated the idea of these bomb-throwing anarchists. Anarchism, sure, why not? You know, anarchism has a, a long association with really great ideas uh, in our society, in society about how to improve and cooperate and work together, uh, which uh, comes out of that Greek term, which I don't know if it was uh, pronounced something other than anarchy. Somebody else here may know that. Um, but um, the idea, the fear that develops around these myths that was the burgeoning, the budding, the budding, the nascent, to, and, the, and then growing labor movement in this country, and particularly in Chicago, where the idea was that to get an eight-hour day was going to probably require more than being at the ballot box. And uh, uh, the woman who spoke best to that, I'll read her words. And I got the idea of propaganda is sometimes the lack of information. Why is it that what I would argue perhaps the most, one of the most important women, if not one of the most important people in American history is Lucy Parsons. And if you asked virtually anybody, they wouldn't have a clue who she is. How is it possible that 99.824% of the population, I made that up, so but you'll remember that number, is uh, uh, probably close to accurate. Wouldn't have a clue about what Haymarket was when then I go on to say maybe the most uh, singularly important event that influenced history in our uh, country, our state, our country, if not the world, in so many ways. And you can draw all kinds of conclusions about what and why it affected uh, uh, people, uh, societies, governments. Um, populations around the world. But Lucy said, and I don't know what year it was written, but it's after the Civil War probably, and because of Lucy Parsons, who um, is uh, uh, um, a woman who understood well the trials and tribulations post-Civil War, um, a woman who is uh, 
I also, what I love about history is the, I call the ironies of history. And this woman, uh, Lucy Parsons, is married to Albert Parsons, who is uh, the only American born of the Haymarket. He was uh, born in Alabama. Uh, he fought in the Civil War as a Confederate soldier lieutenant, born into a prominent family, and denounced it after the Civil War, of course. Because, you know, you do what you have to do, I suppose. Most people do. Um, and he was a Confederate soldier. And what does he do? He meets Lucy Parsons, born from a slave uh, uh, family background, uh, uh, Mexican blood, and a white ex-Confederate soldier marrying a, a black woman uh, and living in Texas in the 1870s. It's, it's almost hard to fathom. To, but they did it, and of course they ended up in Chicago because they were thinkers, intellectuals, writers, organizers, and wanted to change the world, but especially to organize workers into unions. And Lucy said, the idea of less restriction and more liberty and a confiding trust in nature is equal to her work is permeating all modern thought. Of all the modern delusions, the ballot has certainly been the greatest. The fact is money and not votes is what rules the people. Passivity while slavery is stealing over us is a crime. When labor is no longer for sale, society will produce free men and women who will think free, act free, and be free. And so she is equating the idea that after slavery has ended with um, work, slave, slave labor, wage slavery is something that is the most cruel thing. The idea that people are selling their labor for virtually nothing, and um, uh, she argues that passivity is the criminal act. That's what's stealing over us, because if you're not involved in doing something to change it, then you may perhaps be complicit in that crime. And so I think that's what her point was, and that's why she was active till the day she pretty much till the day she died. And I'm sure that's why Eugene Debs and why Lucy, uh, Mother Jones and Emma Goldman probably shared those ideas and said that till the day I die, I have to do something, even if it's writing, you know, if it's delivering speeches on barges on the Chicago River because I'm banned from speaking in the city, but the Chicago River is interstate commerce, so Lucy Parsons went on the barges and wasn't ruled by the law and ordinances of Chicago. Um, so, what we see is the emergence of an incredibly mixed set of ideas about how we change the world after Haymarket, but how do you overcome, how do you overcome the, uh, the um, the power of capital, I guess, is one way to put it. Some of you can understand that statement, um, which is pretty much what Haymarket was all about because of the most revolutionary idea, as simple as it may seem, that you should get paid for the value of your labor. That is so revolutionary that, in fact, no uh, uh, CEO capitalist corporate agenda could ever tolerate that. And you had to wipe out the idea of this labor movement that then, because of the martyrdom, spread throughout the world that created what we know today around the world is one of the most celebrated holidays. I think you all know what holiday that is, right? May Day. May Day. Labor Day. I mean, International Labor Day. It's like, you know, a couple billion people march to celebrate our monument. So, um, in Forest Park, Illinois, and it uh, is, uh, uh, that is a fact. Uh, uh, however, how does it come to be that every country in the world, uh, virtually every country developed and um, uh, less developed, celebrates it as an official holiday, and if not official, it's still a holiday. Uh, and uh, by, uh, I do not believe in India it's an official holiday, but if I'm not mistaken, various Indian Union officials have told me that it's pretty much a holiday for workers in India. You know, a couple hundred million people march uh, somewhere or uh, take, uh, take it a little bit easier. How does it become that the place where the martyrdom takes place is not even recognized and is only recently after the 1890s, early 1900s, then they, you know, uh, you know, uh, 
couple hundred thousand people are members of the Communist Party and a few workers in the 1930s, some big parades, but doesn't really exist until recently with the immigrant rights movement celebrating May Day. And yet, if you talk to many of the immigrant activists, not activists, but immigrants who have marched on the, uh, May 1st, uh, the April of May uh, immigrant rights day since 2006, um, probably know that it's May Day, but they are marching now specifically for immigrant rights. And so there's been this kind of um, bifurcation or uh, um, uh, separation of what the holiday initially was uh, about, which was a fight for the right to organize free association, uh, eight-hour day, um, that sort of thing. But I want to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, uh, I was talking about facts, and I was talking about um, fake news. I'm talking about uh, incorrect information. And just recently, I was doing a little reading about Jane Addams. I had done a rep uh, presentation to a group of uh, people, and I'm going to be talking to some more people, and I needed to know more about Jane Addams, which on one hand, most people never associate Jane Addams with her being really uh, a union activist. It wasn't that she worked for a union, but ultimately, and really as a, uh, a logical extension of her settlement house work, um, the settlement houses were there to organize women into unions. She participated in trying to arbitrate the Pullman strike and the union stockyard strike of 1904. Um, but when people talk about Jane Addams, very few people associate her with the idea of the labor movement, a labor movement. They think of her as, you know, school of social work and um, sometimes, uh, you know, um, uh, the uh, um, struggles uh, or more, more political association with uh, being against World War I. But it's a, uh, um, amazing how few people associate her. We don't know who Lucy Parsons is. We don't know who Emma Goldman is. We don't know who Mother Jones is. We don't know that uh, Jane Addams was um, uh, a struggle for democracy was about organizing workers in many respects. Now I think, let's see if I can find the page. I thought this was interesting because here is this deeply cited, lots of footnotes book about Jane Addams. And the author says, um, she uses the term Lewis Ling committing suicide. Everybody's, you know, mo most people just say that casually. And then she goes on to say, on November 17, 1887, the remaining four were hanged. Now, you know, it's a date. But here I am talking about November 11th. Am I right or is this author right? It's in this big book on Jane Addams using the date November 17th. Um, but it, 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 it gets worse. Here's another book on the education of Jane Addams. And those, Peter, you'll, you'll back me up on this as soon as I can find the uh, right page. Uh, I just yeah, lost I it. Um, a lot of long sentences, yeah. too. By 1886, the city had a well-organized federation of labor, a German central labor union, and close to 4,000 workers enrolled in the Knights of Labor. Actually, I think it was more than that, by the way. Jane Addams later claimed that she was in Europe at the time of Chicago's Haymarket Riot on May 1st, 1886, when a bomb exploded at the Knights of Labor rally and police fired on workers, blah, blah, blah. First of all, the bomb wasn't on May 1st. May 1st was the big, what we're not sure, as the newspapers had conflicting accounts of how many people marched on May 1st. We know that uh, tens of thousands of workers were on strike since uh, uh, all through April and into May for the strike for the eight-hour day, but uh, the bomb-throwing uh, event uh, the tragedy was on May 4th. And then it goes on in this book to talk about Jane Addams and in this other book saying that Jane Addams talks about how Haymarket influenced her, but she still tried to distance herself from it because, as we all know, that it was the first real Red Scare, or big Red Scare in America. 
and uh, what the Red Scare, of course, uh, uh, demonized uh, 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 tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and if not more than that, people's lives, livelihoods, and this Red Scare of 1886, 1887 continued. And so even progressive people, in fact, Jane Addams uh, would tell people that she was in Europe at the time of Haymarket, so she wasn't sure exactly what was going on, but she was sympathetic to it when, in fact, and this is where academics, some say she was in Baltimore, she says she was in Philadelphia. How come we don't even know this and we're writing books about this? So, it really, this tangent of Jane Addams is just to represent the idea that in history, we can't even agree on basic facts, let alone when we uh, um, get a few years removed from it. And so, and we do know, and Peter, I asked you to back me up, am I correct that the hanging was November 11th? Oh, that's a tough oh, okay. question. Okay, I'm putting them on the spot. <laughs> but, but, but am I correct that the bombing was on May 4th, the, the rally at Haymarket Square? Okay. Yeah. And I don't yeah, know if anybody yeah. knows about Jane Addams, but uh, here, you know, people, she's argued, she was told, tried to tell people she was in Europe, but apparently, factually, it's the case that she was either in Baltimore or Philadelphia. Um, so, um, but, and, and two, she was surrounded by pro-labor women. Yes. So Jane may not have been a unionist professional, um, but Florence Kelly was first uh, Secretary of Labor? Yes, correct. First no, that was Frances Perkins. Frances Perkins. Yes. And Florence Kelly was Chicago's uh, industrial inspector. So she was surrounded by state and federal prominent labor people. There was no question where her sympathies were, even though she was not a member of a union. Um, I want to uh, just, I didn't check what time I started. I see it's a couple minutes after 7. So, Keep going. Uh, we, got, we got Hawaii. Okay. 7.30, so 7.40. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go terribly much, much, I can't put those words together, terribly longer. Um, but uh, I uh, um, wanted to um, raise a few of, of these issues. So, you know, I had asked early on about who knew about what the market was, and it was uh, ultimately a rally call to protest police brutality uh, because of the uh, attack on striking workers on May 3rd, where uh, um, that, it was sort of like, you know, we have this, uh, um, and I want to have a contextual framework for what is happening, because the fight for the eight-hour day isn't like one day there's a strike and then the, uh, there's a rally and a bomb is thrown and there's a, a trial. You know, the fight is really, you know, after the uh, Civil War, it's the fight for, uh, you know, democracy in the workplace. And it's uh, especially taking place after the Civil War when men came back from the war and found that uh, 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 their wives uh, and children were working in the factories making, you know, five, you know, pennies uh, an hour. And um, uh, they, you know, it probably took 35 years to get wages restored from what they were at this time of, before the Civil War for the average worker. Um, and so, you know, the fight, the idea that, well, if we don't have to work 14 or 16 hours a day, but we work 10, 9, or 8, 8 hours, 8 hours for work, 8 hours for rest, 8 hours for what we will, um, that we still get paid the same wage. Well, that's uh, cutting into a few uh, um, uh, rubles from, uh, no pun intended, from uh, the uh, profiteers. So it is a uh, revolutionary idea. And um, it, uh, 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 Again, given the limitations of being able to talk about all that was going on from the great upheaval and the almost industrial revolution that nobody knows about in this country, the great strike of 1877, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the Battle of the Viaduct in Chicago, how is it that, uh, you know, th this is literal development of a National Guard and, uh, uh, you know, private security forces to crush an, every worker uh, uprising in this country is not understood, hardly known, and barely uh, um, uh, uh, respected even by the average uh, college student who studies history. And I can say this because I've spoken to many college students, they don't have a clue about any of this stuff. Any of it. None of it. So, they, uh, and then I say, so let me ask you, you just didn't pay attention? 
if you don't have the cognitive ability to understand the information, I'm talking to students at Northwestern, right? Well, of course, they have a cognitive ability, but nobody tells them this. Nobody. We sleepwalk through our society and um, uh, wonder why 6% uh, of the private sector workforce is uh, uh, in a union and 94% are not. Although every wealthy person has many unions representing them, as I stated early on. So, um, somebody has to take the blame, right? So you have this rally that very few people come to on this cold winning night on May 4th of 1886. Uh, 2,500 people show up instead of the 20,000 they were hoping for, or the organizers of this rally, uh, and uh, uh, men who barely knew each other, uh, but somehow are now considered engaged in a great conspiracy to commit uh, violence and murder, according to the uh, state's attorney, um, which is really the owners of the corporations. And again, as we know, and in this room we probably agree, when you talk about the state's attorney, Maybe not as much today, but probably still. Certainly the federal states, regardless of party, uh, or the, I should say prosecuting <laughs> attorney, um, the judges, they are, are they not merely an extension of corporate, corporate corporations? That's, corporations are people and they're representing people. So um, uh, this is uh, uh, 1886. This incredible trial, let's find eight men. It's as simple as that, let's find eight men who are leaders, because that is the closing statement of Grinnell, the uh, state's attorney, when he has no evidence to convict men of violence because seven police died when a bomb was thrown and police shot each other. One died by the bomb. Nobody knows who threw the bomb at this rally, but uh, arguably could very well have been, you know, the person representing the corporations. Who knows? We can make that argument very well. Um, but it is a, uh, a the basis, the pretext for crushing the labor movement. And, uh, and so uh, bring eight men, call them uh, uh, crazy, uh, put them up for trial. It's a kangaroo court, well recognized as the only good governor this state ever had, pardon them, uh, when he gets into office in 1893 uh, after uh, Clarence Darrow said, you ought to look at this trial. And John Peter Altgeld said, these guys uh, were wrongful, that they were all wrongfully brought to trial. The trial was a sham, uh, but you can't bring these guys back to life. And uh, But um, we do have a nice plaque on the back of the monument that uh, uh, with the words of John Governor John Peter Altgeld. Um, so the trial is um, probably the trial of the century. It was certainly uh, bigger. Uh, it was the uh, OJ trial of the time, uh, for a lack of a better uh, comparison. Um, and perhaps almost uh, um, unfortunate that I say that, but I'm just trying to find something with the, when we think of a trial, you know, the Scopes Monkey trial, or, you know, Sacco and Benzetti that didn't even rise to the level of what Haymarket was. But when I started thinking about this idea of uh, how do we know what's accurate, it really was, even though I was going to talk about Haymarket as the anniversary, it was Charlie's doing, it was Charlie, uh, if you saw the electronic uh, posting of this particular event, um, he put out he put a, an illustration that was popular at the time of, and that continues to be in books about Haymarket, which is police come to restore order. I think is that what it said? Yeah. yeah. Um, to restore order. Just like Mayor Daly said in 68, mm -hmm. the confrontation was not created by the police. The confrontation was created by the people who charged the police. Gentlemen, let's get one thing straight once and for all. The policeman isn't there to create disorder. The policeman is there to preserve disorder. <laughs> so this, of course, is a history of the role of police represent, you know, it being in paid status of corporate America, and, you know, maybe a little different from the anti-Vietnam uh, days of rage, but uh, certainly most of the police violence against workers was part and parcel of the fact that uh, um, the corporations uh, uh, have them in their pocket to uh, um, crush worker uh, uh, uprisings of every sort. Um, 
And um, uh, so the trial, if you have these representations of flaming bomb throwers and all of this, I know that there are some people now talking, you know, there's a, a I don't know, you may have spoken to this group uh, who wrote a book in the last year or two that um, many of us who retell the story of Haymarket and try to suppress uh, the idea that uh, the um, Haymarket activists were um, really, you know, all uber radical and, uh, um, uh, and yeah, bomb throwers. Bomb throwers. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's uh, people knew about dynamite. People used dynamite. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Louis Ling knew how to make bombs, but uh, just the very fact that people knew this stuff or were aware of it or were around it does not mean that there's a conspiracy to throw a bomb at Haymarket and to commit murder. Um, this is just simply an opportunity to create a fiction to crush the one thing that could change the world for workers. It continues to be the same struggle today, which is why I take us back to, or forward to the present, which is that um, the entire uh, um, the governmental industrial uh, uh, complex um, is designed is designed to uh, prevent workers from organizing, and in so many ways, even it, it just is a. It, it, you, some of you know you will be fired if you try to organize a union, and so what has happened because of the success of organizing unions in the public sector, as uh, we deindustrialized America and basically became a right to work, uh, a right to work for less society through. Uh, the legislation um, uh, in state by state, 30 out of 50 states are, uh, I think it's 30 out of 50 now, I, I may be wrong on the number, uh, I don't want to spread false rumors, and now our, uh, is it, it's somewhere in the mid-20s, our right-to-work right right to work states. Which, We're surrounded, so that we know. How many of you know that there's uh, the Supreme Court is going to rule in 2018 on a case called Janus versus AFSCME? Okay, this is basically the uh, 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 will probably, I would say, 98% chance that unless Gorsuch rules otherwise or Kennedy flips, uh, there, I think it was Kennedy, um, uh, there is going right to work in the public sector. So who's the largest number of organized workers in this country? Public sector. Uh, by June of 2018, it, may, it will likely be the case that public sector workers nationally will no longer have the right to collect uh, agency fees, which will give them the resources to continue to represent workers in this country. It'll be like every uh, right to work state, like Wisconsin, Indiana. Yeah, and this Michigan. is Governor Rauner, who Michigan. is Michigan, um, uh, of all places, right? And so, how do we even fathom an idea? that we can live in a society in 2017 going to 2018 where 6% of the private sector workforce is organized, where um, uh, uh, um, the largest <coughs> sector of represented workers in this country are going to lose uh, a, a huge, basically it's going to be um, right to work nationally in this country. Um, it's, it's, not like this in any developed country in the world, but I'm not telling you something you don't already know because you can talk about health care and um, uh, uh, corporate power anyway. So um, there is, uh, um, is, is there hope for us? And I'm going to continue to argue that uh, in this idea that I continue to develop on unions and democracy and a democratic society that you can't have one without the right to have a union in a workplace because unions probably continue to be um, the largest mediating institution left in America. Some people argue, well, the church can be a mediating institution, but it's uh, much more, um, as we know, um, uh, uh, parochial if you will, uh, in terms of denomination and particular philosophy. So despite the fact that uh, there's no, uh, unions do not necessarily represent one idea uh, politically, um, uh, and as we know, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? I think the metaphor might be, is there parallel parking in a parallel universe? 
how is it that, you know, a guy like Trump comes along and supports the broad concept of challenging free trade without going into particulars about, you, I don't think unions uh, in this country that have spoken out against uh, the NAFTAs and the CAFTAs and the TPPs and those sorts of things are saying there shouldn't be trade laws. It just should be that they should be mediated and negotiated with labor rights for workers and environmental laws and things like that. So, but, um, uh, you know, there is this, uh, uh, but as we know, much of the white workforce in this country voted for Trump and because in many cases supported his broad global pun intended statements about trade because unions have educated their workers and a lot of workers in Ohio and in Michigan and Indiana who are in unions get the information and support the idea that there is no fair trade and that free trade means unfair trade and voted for Trump on that basis. No doubt about it, even though what Trump represents is uh, really to, he'll do anything to promote the corporate agenda, but it's demagoguery and people have lived in, um, uh, had their ideas and beliefs perpetuated by demagoguery uh, long before Huey Long and uh, um, uh, uh, long after, you know, uh, other um, presidents and governors. So we are left with uh, um, trying to sort fact from fiction, um, and uh, I would suspect that if we can't have the right to organize freely, to associate freely like the wealthy do, um, and until uh, that exists, the idea of democracy will continue to be challenged will be something that uh, we may not be able to, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not a um, uh, totally, I'm not, I'm somewhere between totally pessimistic and totally optimistic. I guess that puts me in the middle. Um, because there are days when I believe that when I look at history and I look at the courage of the people after Haymarket, you know, literally died and uh, they didn't intend to go to their death, uh, but I'll read their last words, um, thanks to Charlie putting them on the, uh, uh, um, electronically, um, and many people around the world continue to live by these words. And so I'll end with, while these aren't, the, the last words, while the, just before they were hanged, are, uh, uh, the, uh, I'll mention, uh, August Spee said during the year between his um, sentencing and the um, attempts to uh, challenge the outcome of the trial, he said, your ropes will effectively stop us from speaking, but the time will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you are strangling today. And he wrote, uh, that was at the time, moment of the hanging, but he wrote, and that's by the way on the base of the monument, and the word throttling is used instead of strangle. Um, but he went on to say, here you will tread upon a spark, and here and there and behind you and in front of you and everywhere the flames will blaze up. You cannot put it out, the ground is on fire upon which you stand. Now these are my ideas. They constitute a part of myself. I say if death is the penalty for proclaiming the truth, then I will profoundly, proudly, and defiantly pay the costly price. Call your hangman. I am ready for him. Uh, Adolf Fischer, his assistant, uh, uh, assistant editor, wrote, The call for our hanging is a death blow against free speech, free assembly, and free thoughts in this country. If death is the penalty you insist on for our love of freedom and for the human race, I will not remonstrate. George Engel. Uh, I found long ago that working men had no more rights than anywhere else in the world. The history of all time teaches us that oppressing classes always maintain their tyranny by force and violence. My last message is this. Believe no more in the ballot and use all other means at your command. No power on earth can rob the working man of his knowledge of how to make bombs, and that knowledge he now possesses. I say, down with the thugs. I say, peace to the producers. I am done. And Albert Parsons, 
in addition, his very final words were, let the voice of the, let me speak, let me speak, let the voice of the people be heard, he said. Dynamite comes as the emancipator of man from the domination and enslavement of his fellow man. It is democratic, it makes everybody equal. It is a peacemaker. It is man's best and lasting friend. Our message remains today on our last day what it was on our very first day. Agitate, organize, revolt. <coughs> so um, during this period between the end of the trial, uh, after the trial, the sentencing, and the hanging, there was a lot of rhetoric and a lot of discussion, a lot of writing, and uh, um, uh, the idea of, uh, um, as I think it was August Spies pointed out during the trial, that uh, partly what the uh, corporate agenda was, uh, the state's attorney in particular and Judge Geary were trying to do is say that they were fomenting, uh, that they were starting the revolution on May uh, 1st of uh, 1886, May 4th of 1886. And as uh, August Spies pointed out in, uh, in talking uh, at, at the trial that uh, no, uh, only a simpleton could even argue that the revolution is because of uh, going to happen on a particular day and on a particular day alone, that it is a historical process. Uh -huh. And so um, apparently the, uh, um, uh, uh, we have reached a point in our society where we do have, this is where optimism comes for me, because during this period after Haymarket, especially when the, you know, uh, the idea of international labor Workers of the World Unite wasn't a possibility, despite the rhetoric of the day. But we are so much closer to the probability, insofar that um, there's very there's an alliance, the ability to have an alliance of workers around the world, given how small the world has become. Disney was right, right? You know, when he said it's a small, small world after all. And it is because we know that what happens in China affects what happens in Nigeria, and what happens in um, uh, Mexico affects what happens in Great Britain, and what happens in one particular country is no longer just in and of itself in a vacuum. We are so connected and interconnected, and sometimes pathologically so. Uh, through the internet, but at the same time, the opportunity exists, and this is where the optimism comes from. But it will have to be through organized workers, I believe, in some way. It may not look like a union of today, but it will be an association in some way of people who produce, not those who profit. And those are my words for the evening. I just want to point out, because sometimes these uh, things aren't available. I just happen to have, because I'm like a roving book uh, salesman, you know, the Fuller Brush Man. There's, I see the agent, some of you. You know the Fuller Brush Man. Um, uh, um, I happen to have, uh, because I think it's one of the best books on the topic, and certainly one of the most recent. I just happen to have two Death at the Haymarket. If you're carrying around um, 20, uh, 17, 1695, uh, uh, 15 bucks, I just happen to have a couple. Uh, we sell the Labor History Society. James Green, who died this uh, uh, last year, a great historian, um, his book on the Haymarket. I just happen to have a couple, so if somebody wanted, and I have a couple of those. And I also have, for those of you who uh, want to make your own pilgrimage out to uh, the cemetery in Haven. We sell these for ten, I'm selling them for five, but if you have economic needs and can't come up with the five, but you would like the book that uh, the day will come, uh, uh, our uh, Labor History uh, Society's book on the Haymarket Monument, uh, and with little biographies of the many people who are there and um, uh, some that aren't in here. I'll make these available for a couple bucks uh, for those who okay. want one of these. Where is the Haymarket? Is that the? Can you spell? Tell us oh, where exactly? Yeah. So where there, it is? there, are, it, so there are two places when we talk about the Haymarket. The cemetery, which is where um, the, uh, 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 the, uh, the martyrs are, is in Forest Park, Illinois, on Display Avenue, right off of the Blue Line uh, at uh, the last stop of the Blue Line, going out to Forest Park, not O'Hare. 
um, Forest Park, Illinois, was once called Waldheim Cemetery, now called Forest Home, and where the only place they could be buried, uh, uh, I didn't even talk about uh, the, the funeral uh, the next day, but um, um, uh, there's also Haymarket Square, where the events on May 4th of 1886 took place, which is at basically the corner of Randolph and Des Plaines Avenue in Chicago, on the, uh, just wet, uh, um, just west of the river and just uh, east of uh, the Kennedy Expressway there. And uh, by the way, uh, this is an example of how, I guess you would say, myth propaganda specifically, which uh, entices and uh, perpetuates fear, uh, meant that until 2004, there was really nothing in Haymarket Square to represent one of the most significant historical events in modern history. There was just a little plaque on the sidewalk that uh, uh, Mayor Harold Washington agreed to put on in the concrete to say this is where Haymarket was. People from all over the world would come to, where was the Haymarket rally? And there was nothing there, but um, for many, many years, this was why the Illinois Labor History Society was created. Uh, because in 1969, Studs Terkel, Les uh, Rear, Bill Edelman, Lillian Hurstein, and other uh, uh, great people got together to create the Haymarket Workers Memorial Committee to remember the Haymarket. And so um, for years, the city of Chicago objected vehemently to the idea that there should be anything to recognize the work <laughs> what happened in Haymarket Square. And um, uh, so, but a monument uh, is there. It's actually owned by the city. This is not the ILHS monument. Uh, but uh, we came up with the idea that this should be a gathering place every May 1st to recognize International Labor Day. And so, if you go there, if you haven't been there, you'll see plaques. And we have all of them up. The monument was just restored again, and uh, it was uh, relocated back to Haymarket Square just a month or so ago. Uh, it was, there was uh, construction going on. And you'll see plaques dedicated to international labor uh, from, let's see. India, uh, India Japan. Well, in, in, uh, um, uh, Iraq, uh, Sweden, France, Japan, uh, Japan Canada. Um, this is since 2005. Um, I'll forget them all. A uh, large European uh, coalition. Uh, um, uh, we just had Greece last year and um, uh, two years ago in Turkey this last year. Um, uh, boy, I'm, uh, Colombia was the first one. Uh, I mentioned Mexico. Uh, anyway, it's uh, the idea that uh, workers of the world unite and, uh, from whatever denomination you belong to. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully you can get there and get to the cemetery to pay homage to uh, the idea. The, uh, and um, uh, look forward to any questions, comments, or uh, ideas that you want to, uh, or myths you wish, or propaganda you wish to perpetuate tonight. Okay, let's thank our speaker. Okay, so, until Andy comes back, just go ahead and call on somebody. Okay, well, I think I saw out of the corner of my eye your hand. What is the right to work state you're referring to? Right to work. So, um, uh, the idea of right to work, this again goes to the issue of, think about the language. I think most of you probably know, but um, not everybody does. Um, the language, the right to work. The idea that a union cannot compel people to pay dues or fees to support the organization that bargains and represents them. They can only collect them voluntarily. And so um, in the uh, states around the country uh, have enacted laws, uh, which by the way, the right to work idea grows out of uh, the guy that started the um, John Birch Society. Oh. Um, and um, uh, it really started getting pushed in the 1970s in a big way where unions simply could only maintain voluntary membership or could not um, compel people who are represented by the union to pay dues or fees as it were in the public sector. And so um, we're all compelled. We may not all do it. Um, uh, oh, I'm on YouTube, and I want you to know I do pay my taxes. Uh, but not if some people protest, right? Um, 
but we mostly believe that we should pay our taxes because of the value and the benefits we get, uh, uh, even if we don't always agree with what those taxes go for. Um, so when unions negotiate a contract uh, and rep are required to represent all workers that are in that uh, union in that particular place where there's a collective bargaining agreement or contract, they uh, require them to pay dues in the public sector it's to pay a volunteer, it's to pay a fee commensurate with dues, but not totally dues. Um, right to work is you don't have to do that. And as we know, people will often choose not to, they'll take the benefits, but they won't pay the tax. Right, it's a free load. Yeah, it's a free loader, as uh, we often say, free riders free in the public riders. sector. That's what right to work is, and it decimates the power of the union. I think I saw so here, I'm just going to go around it okay. that way. I, so. Right uh, at what you're talking about there, I, as I recall, SEIU lost a court case about, I think it's called Fair Share, mm -hmm. where uh, you were just talking about that. Now, what's the difference between that and this AFSCME case you're talking that about? That is the same thing. It, okay. it, and in fact, it was the Fair Share was where Rick got a California teacher. Um, mm -hmm. The case that's now going, and what happened was, is that uh, uh, last year, uh, um, uh, the Supreme Court Justice uh, Scalia died, who was going to be the deciding, would have been the deciding vote to end fair share in the public sector, which is what Janice is about. And uh, now that there's a new uh, um, Supreme, there's going to be a ruling because the Supreme Court in August took the case, the Governor Rauner is pushing Valjanus for his AFSCME to end fair share. And that's the same thing as right to work, which decimates the ability of the union to have resources. So what has always been the case of the anti-tax, the anti-union, uh, the right to work, uh, the right to, by the way, these people are all defended by uh, COPE money. Uh, and the, the, legal, the legal defense of the National Right to Work Chamber Committee, uh, the ALEC, it's all connected. This is where I wouldn't say it's a conspiracy. It's an understood fact that there's a representation of the corporate agenda through these uh, anti-union unions. And so they've pooled their resources. They've uh, anointed a Supreme Court that will rule against unions almost <coughs> every time it can. Uh, and. Uh, um, it will uh, be very, very difficult to continue to organize because it's called starving the beast, right? You know, you take the resources away from the one organization that represents millions and millions of workers that are unions or organizations collectively. So that's fair share, right to work, same thing. We are very all. Thank you. Uh, you said that. Uh, Unions today are basically democratic institutions? I said that they are designed to be democratic <laughs> institutions. I would argue oh, no. that uh, uh, there is a good uh, reason uh, that many people feel that unions are not. And well, some yeah. are and some are not. You know, I was going to uh, continue yeah. and ask uh, about, uh, well, the last time I checked into that aspect of uh, American unions, um, th there were. Um, uh, the most numerous um, unions, uh, the, the, the ones that represented most employees, uh, largely did not have direct uh, public election of uh, their uh, national or international yeah. presidents. Yeah. That uh, the um, they were elected by the uh, by the local presidents, and there was no uh, uh, no uh, election. Uh, for, for many of the, of the international and national presidents that, that involve the rank and file. Uh, how is that uh, democratic? Well, what I would argue is that from a different perspective, that uh, certainly like the union that I, I belong to, I worked for, um, and I was staff, so I was employed. I was not uh, an elected official um, of the union. But uh, the vast majority of presidents are elected democratically and or potentially democratically if people come to vote. Um, uh, but it's uh, in most unions at the local level, which makes up the power of most unions at many, you know, at the, again at the local level, are democratic. Um, the issue of representation or delegate, delegated voting is pretty much the structure of most organizations. 
um, uh, in, in this country. Whether or not it's the best way to be, I have no idea. I, I, I couldn't tell you if I believe that uh, every worker in the country, a, you know, with 400,000 member organization would cast a ballot, just like in corporations, you know, a handful of people uh, uh, vote for uh, uh, the shareholders' vote. Um, probably would be one, I, again, this isn't, I, I um, don't know if it would be more democratic if one person, one vote for an international president of uh, 200,000, 500,000, 1 million member, 60,000 member organization is more democratic or not. I don't have a but. At the local level, people are, have the right to participate in most unions, not all. Um, and it's like volunteerism in general. Do people choose to volunteer or people do? Does a, a good union will actually educate its members to try to get involved? And I can tell you that that's a struggle. Um, but that's the struggle of democracy anyway. Democracy is full of all kinds of problems, getting people to be involved, the, um, and uh, uh, which is, of course, also the strength of a democracy. So it's a long winded answer of saying, uh, I, you're right that it's not one person, one vote at a national level. And whether it should be or shouldn't be, I think that's organizations have to figure that out. But as institutions, um, what in this issue of democracy is, not for me, isn't so much about the institutional democracy, but it's the idea that in the workplace, what unions do is they give people resources to be able to actually have a voice on the job. As we know, there is a reason that usually, you know, of course it can vary, there are some companies that have liberal policies, but basically you have no rights, you're right, you know, it's, you are, you're an employee at will, uh, you have no rights, but unions bring democracy to a workplace which give people a sense of participation because there are labor management committees, there are health and safety committees, it's committee up the wazoo getting people to volunteer, that's the hard part. Um, and, uh, but when you talk to people, union members vote at a much higher rate in electoral, uh, our corrupt electoral system, uh, vote at a much higher rate than non-union members. In 2010, 2008 election, um, and it's, it's pretty close to this, it was less this last time, um, 20 uh, union members that represent 12% of the workforce voted, were 26% of the uh, voting population because unions bring organization in some sense of information that you otherwise don't get. So in that sense, the sense that you can uh, debate, that it, those of you who've been in unions, where uh, you may have some debate, or the opportunity for debate, learn skills about civic participation as democracy. Civic participation, being active, is democracy. And so that's why I make this argument that without unions, you lose one of the institutions, and probably the best institution, for giving people skills at the grassroots level to uh, encourage democratic values. Okay. And it's uh, going to be a lost art if people don't have unions, even if their own union is corrupt. But, okay. so. Next question. Yeah, um, I looked up Lucy Parsons on the, the Wikipedia page real quick. I see that there's a park in Chicago oh, that's really? named after, and, and there's also a bookstore in Boston, Massachusetts. Have you been to this bookstore? Do you I've know not been about to the bookstore, but we, are, we were involved in the park, which goes back to the issue of perpetuating um, uh, uh, fake news or propaganda. So let me just say something about Lucy Parsons Park, which is just east of Cicero on Belmont Avenue, not far from here. The east of Cicero on where? Uh, Belmont. And, and it's um, so even after the monument in Haymarket Square was finally produced after so much debate by uh, the city council and the mayors, you know, opposing these radical bomb throwers, Lucy Parsons Park, some of you may have known this, was, it was very hard to get a park. There is no, I think it is. Maybe the only park named after a woman in the city of Chicago. No, Charlie, I, you're I ran that project. <coughs> I that was my project. That was his project. Yeah. Anyway, the short of it is that Lucy Park, we, the Labor Society, are in process. We, have, you know, talk about committees. 
trying to move getting something at Lucy Parsons Park, like a plaque, like a statue or something that actually says who she was. <laughs> who, who is she, right? You know. But um, this last year, uh, Alderman, uh, um, uh, right here, um, uh, Rosa, um, uh, helped getting uh, part of uh, Kedzie named Lucy Parsons uh, Way. So there's a stretch, what is it, south of Addison. Uh, I can't, I don't, we, and we had a little thing on May uh, 1st there, uh, uh, celebrating Lucy Parsons Way. But the issue was that the city and the parks district uh, fought the idea of naming something after Lucy Parsons because she was bomb throwing radical trying to kill police. You know, this whole thing, it's always about, you know, you have to create this uh, dynamic between once you invoke police or military, suddenly you're anti patriotic, you're not an American, you know, you're bad. And that's the struggle. You know, how do you, uh, so, um, and, you know, think about it. At the funeral, the procession down Milwaukee Avenue on May, on November 12th of 1887, the day after the hanging, uh, with the horse-drawn carriages and the coffins. Um, fact or fiction, I don't know, but people write that 500,000 people lined the streets of Chicago to view the, the bodies because underneath the, uh, uh, the fear was great support for the fight for the eight-hour day and the recognition that this was a corrupt trial and that this was a travesty of justice. And what people did was they were uh, they were told the city had proclaimed no flags or anything, but people came out with their American flags, you know. And um, uh, it's just interesting because there's this tendency to always talk about this patriotic or not patriotic, whatever that means. You know, the last reference of the scoundrel, wrap yourself in the flag and carry the cross. But um, uh, the flag was very prominent uh, for, and it's always been for, uh, um, uh, that, even in May Day parades. Uh, I think here and then I'll zigzag across. Okay. In, in uh, relation to your comments about uh, right to work. A little louder, okay. please. Okay. In, in relation to your comments about right to work, uh, this misnomer, the name right to work, obviously, uh, is more like doublespeak out of 1984. Right. <laughs> <coughs> My question to you is, would you associate this as just one piece of the puzzle that goes together with so many other aspects of money controlling the society, such as Citizens United, such as the net, net neutrality issue going on right now, and it's all a matter of dumbing down and silencing the general public to and necessary yeah, I, uh, I always workers. I, I agree, but I call it. I just use the term corporate agenda. To me, that makes more sense because it comes from capital, you know, money, corporations, and uh, uh, as I referenced the point of the Supreme Court case where corporations were deemed to be individuals, and Citizens yeah. United, sort of the other end of the, the other side of the balance that equation uh, to create. Uh, in many ways, the conspiracy to suppress workers from having rights in this country um, and citizens, of course. So um, it is a, uh, um, uh, yeah, and that's why I referenced a few moments ago ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Commission, which is made up. You could talk on and on about these unions of corporations. Again, you know, they all have unions that represent them, carry out a political and legislative agenda, which is basically to suppress workers' voice at the top and then citizens as, or citizens and workers equally. Um, but uh, and this goes back to the idea of democracy, which is that you can only have, uh, you have no rights as a worker in this country unless there's legislation for it. It comes usually from organizing and representation, which often is through a union. Um, uh, and that's, again, why if we expunge unions from our um, language, from our lexicon, as well as in practical reality, uh, we are that much closer to a fascist state. Okay. Just a follow -up. Can you speak to a, a little bit to the extent to how we've come from 50 years ago from a highly unionized society? What 
what the major factors were in <laughs> bringing us back down. Yeah, that's all talk, but I will just simply say that it's been the it's it's it's, it's since the Red Scare of Haymarket that's been the agenda. But in his, history, we know that uh, there are unique periods when people successfully organize because, you know, let's use the cliche, certain conditions exist because there is, an, a, there, there is a, a will among people who are active. The Lucy Parsons is our representative saying passivity is a criminal act, that those who choose not to be passive act and organize, and there's times when people come together and the conditions are better, and it may be that uh, there's a war, uh, World War I, and suddenly there's a need for more labor. And, you know, you put these all things together and you can grow. And another reason I'm not pessimistic is by 1920, remember, remember, I, I don't, shouldn't say remember, but as some of us know, that uh, the government, uh, through the corporations, crushed unions after World War I, deported virtually every union activist that was not born in this country, um, and uh, murdered many and had Palmer raids and uh, unions shrunk to two and a half percent of the workforce. Um, but the period of 1935, 1937 to 1945, uh, 10 million people joined unions because legislation was passed, forced uh, on Roosevelt, the National Labor Relations Act that he signed initially probably a little bit reluctantly, but became aware that his constituency was that uh, progressive coalition of activists, communists, socialists, unionists, citizen activists, and others, and um, recognized the New Deal was a good idea. Um, uh, we can debate whether he did or didn't uh, think it was a good deal in the beginning, but um, uh, when the President of the United States says, and all of you who have been to my labor history classes see the poster, the famous poster, if I worked in a factory, I would join a union, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Could you imagine the President of the United States if Obama had said that? Okay. Even Obama would use the word union, except in a union convention. Um, Bill Clinton was a lot worse. We're talking Democrats, so you, as you know, Republicans, it's no union. Um, I think I add something for the question. Oh. It's a key point. The, uh, you ask about why unions are declining. Well, I, 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 I wanted him to, to speak to the effect Specific, okay. specific instances in the decline of the laws, which laws have changed, changing the effectiveness of union negotiating and organizing. There's one event that happened in America in 1973 that has the last 44 years, 45 years. That is event, uh, Lewis Powell, who became a Supreme Court Justice, wrote the Powell Memo in 1973, a memo to the Chamber of Commerce and other rich billionaires. They said, Middle class people and unionized people have got too much wealth. They're building home wealth and everything else. We got to start taking it back. Otherwise, if we have too much democracy, okay. middle class people will start voting themselves good stuff. We still so the attack on unions really started in 1973. Okay, now we got to move on to the next question. I, there's a lot more I can say about it, but afterwards, we'll be fine. yes, sir. The two candidates last year that I'm aware of that were in support of repealing the Taft Hartley Act. For Jill Stein of the Green Party, and of course Bernie Sanders running as an open democratic socialist. Now, I can argue he was really a social democrat, but I appreciated his candidacy to give a positive light to that term. Tell us about the people we didn't hear about last year. They were also talking about repealing Taft Hartley, but would have never gotten the money or the media coverage that a Jill Stein having ran for governor in Massachusetts previously and been known as a 2012 Green Party candidate or a senator for the United States federal legislator like a Bernie Sanders. Tell us more about people who are saying repeal Taft-Hartley that we also need to know about that the media won't go. You tell us because I'm not sure I know who at a national level is, is saying that. Who well, yeah, the only person I know is Dennis Kucinich, and he's okay. been gerrymandered out. Yeah. No, I mean, it's not, uh, and again, that we're getting a little bit into the weeds, although it's fundamentally important because of when you ask your question, was Taft Hartley, that really is the first major attack to try to keep unions from having power. But that's a, a, a three week course in 1947. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Charlie's had his hand up. And All right. Uh, Larry, uh, all week long in the news, the government of the United States is upset because these foreigners 
we're trying to influence events in the United States. Now you show up and you want to celebrate. These guys, none of them, except the one exception, were Americans over here causing trouble and influencing events. Right? You're talking about the Haymarket, you know, yeah. six, seven. Yeah, you uh, want to get more One was born in England, six were born in Germany, right? And so, is it, was there a question? I'm sorry. Are they, they're foreigners over here. What are they doing over here? Oh, well, that's people come to, came to the, yeah, they were foreigners. The Native Americans are asking so the same thing about all of us. <laughs> anyway, actually, what the, po the point is, I often talk about today when we celebrate uh, uh, the issues of that time of 1886, 1887, uh, where, in, you know, from May, may very well have been immigrant rights. Uh, obviously, you know, the ironically, the development, uh, the creation of uh, uh, unions in part was an anti-immigration, anti-Chinese, uh, uh, you know, the union label. Um, that was about uh, getting a label, a union label on the cigar so that Chinese workers uh, who were brought here to build the railroads and semi-enslaved by the corporations were making cigars much cheaper. Um, so the issue of, uh, and this goes back to uh, the, uh, my uh, comrade's question um, to, uh, about the decline of unions, is it's a race to the bottom and the fight to either oppose the race to the bottom or a fight to get to the race to the bottom, which is about using immigrant labor uh, in part, um, uh, but then deporting people when they're no longer needed to import new people. Uh, to, to come and do the labor. That's part of the race to the bottom. The other race to the bottom is that you have unfair trade laws and you don't make anything where you live. Uh, that's a race to the bottom. But more importantly is uh, having a, a livable wage system uh, for low, uh, what we call low wage workers. Okay. You know? And so um, it is a, uh, a combination of all these things. And um, uh, so 1947, Taft-Hartley, 1973, the Powell uh, situation in 1981, the air traffic controllers, the right of the president to fire any worker that is on strike, is basically why uh, those three things together create uh, the dynamic to make it very hard to have a union. Okay, at this point we're going to have to cut off questions and go directly to rebuttals. Give our Andy, speaker a hand. Okay, uh, thank you for a good talk tonight, and uh, let's have a, a show of hands. Who wants to give a rebuttal? I'll take it now. We're a little short on time tonight. Keep your hands up. One, two, three, four here. Tim's five. I'm six. So that's six people. There'll okay. be more. Uh, we'll, we'll go about, about four minutes. We'll go four minutes apiece, and we will cut it off in half an hour. So uh, be aware. Jonathan's going to be first. All right, Jonathan. Four minutes. Thank you, to the Speaker. Uh, candidates for public office who genuinely support workers' rights to organize and to go on strike uh, in the United States get the least amount of financial donations. <laughs> Candidates who support unions get the least amount of endorsements from current and former government members. They're the least interviewed by the corporate media. They're the least likely to be invited to debates. They're the least likely to even have their name and party affiliation and policy platform briefly covered in the media. And uh, this is very, very appropriate for this last week. They're at least likely to have their book reviewed or discussed or interviewed about their new book. What chutzpah or what hubris. Um, you know, we need to repeal the Taft-Hartley Act. We need to uh, just start from the drawing board again on why workers' rights are central to humanity. And we have a, need to have a discussion of why corporate uh, uh, America needs to have its charter revoked and permanently abolished. Uh, this is an out of control, uh, psychopath, sociopath system that we currently have in corporate America. And I think most of us can agree on that. Our country is the world. And our countrymen and countrywomen are all humankind. 
Uh, Albert Parsons said that in, in 1879 in a testimony on the labor question addressed to the U.S. Congress. So he was well known in Washington, D.C. as someone who wasn't going to let oligarchs get away with it anymore. They knew who he was. They target these people. They label them and they go after them and it's nasty. And every time you see a public official or somebody who is running for public office uh, say they're for the workers, but then they don't get very specific about repealing Taft-Hartley or why the Powell memo was as close to treason, if not treason, as you can get. You better ask yourself whether they deserve your money or your time or your trust. Now, we have people who run for public office who are very brave in this country. We have people like Bernie Sanders, Cynthia McKinney, Jill Stein, Rosa Clemente, Sherry Honkala, Ajama Baraka, Dennis Kucinich, Ralph Nader. Um, they know that 12% of workers in the United States being in unions is a danger sign that things are not the way they should be. So why is the system so mad at us, so furious at us? Those of us who are members of Madison, Wisconsin, of Occupy Wall Street, of Black Lives Matter, of Standing Rock, of any movement that says that workers should be at the center of the community and not billionaires. You know, is it because we're so, you know, dangerous or violent? No, it's because we celebrate solidarity and that we're not afraid to live. You know, we're not minds and voices and bodies. First and foremost, we're spirits who love living with a purpose. We're spiritual beings. And it's who we are. Not how much time we are alive or aren't alive, or how much money is or isn't in our bank accounts, or how much popularity we do or do not acquire in our lifetimes. Every second our spirits gets better, every moment we are evolving, every heartbeat we are learning to be human. You learning? And if we enact many of the same policies that remind people of Iceland, of Sweden, of Denmark, of Finland, and Norway, and France, and Spain, that's not anti-American. They've implemented all of the policies that were suggested in the second chapter of the New Deal by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but never got a vote. You know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't guarantee that things will improve, but we at least should try it for a couple of generations. And if it doesn't work, that's why the pendulum can go back right again. We need to go left. To conclude, I just want to remind everybody, in John chapter 2, the one time in the entire scriptures where Jesus becomes angry is when he ousts the uh, money changers out of the temple. And I think it's long overdue we oust some uh, current money changers out of the White House. Well, uh, thank the speaker. Uh, he did a better job of uh, telling about how difficult it is to figure out what history says. I talked about that last week, I think, in my, in my, uh, I'm sorry, in my uh, rebuttal. But he did a much better job of that. We you heard about the Powell memo, and uh, uh, Hedrick Smith wrote a book. Uh, who, who, who destroyed the American dream? Who killed the American dream, I think it was. Uh, if you want to read about the uh, Powell memo, that would be a good one to, uh, to read. Uh, it's a little more conservative than I am, but uh, it's, it's certainly worth reading. Another book uh, that I want to mention is uh, Michael Geekin. You never heard of him, probably. Two people in here heard of him. He's a community organizer. But he, he wrote a book, Going Public, and it has to do, in my opinion, with unions. Uh, there, he said there's three sectors of society. There's the economic sector, the business, the economic sector, the government sector, and the third sector. That's where the community organizing uh, goes on. 
And I would suggest, and I think it's happening, that unions that are now on the ropes in many ways should join the third sector because uh, community organizing and uh, labor organizing are very, very closely related. In fact, I think that community organizing came out of labor organizing. So uh, I suggest they, they uh, join us in community organizing because uh, the elites uh, always, 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 always divide and conquer. And community organizing always unites and fights. So it's a good uh, thing for unions to do, and uh, certainly we would welcome them. I should say that SIEIU gave us Jane Adams Senior Caucus 5,000 bucks. That's a hell of a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, our, our budget is maybe 400,000, but that's still a hell of a lot of money. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good luck, All right. All right. Four minutes. Chris mentioned the Occupy movement, and um, I was in uh, Occupy Chicago. I was in the labor working group, and uh, I would see Larry and also his colleague at some of the meetings, and uh, that was a beautiful thing, I thought, the Occupy movement, and the fact that it sizzled, I think, is a, is a, a sad thing. Um, I want to make uh, one little correction. Hold on for a second. It didn't, it became Bernie. Sorry about the trouble. Bernie can't be sure. No worries. I don't have the most favorite voice. I probably blew it. No, it's just a matter of. It became the Bernie can't be Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Reset the clock. Yep. I'll reset the clock. All right. All right. Time. Go ahead. I want to make a, a small correction about the. Uh, statement made about the uh, right to work not existing in other countries, especially uh, Europe, uh, but uh, they basically have right to work in France. Um, there, there is uh, no requirement at all that uh, people um, who benefit from what the labor unions do uh, uh, pay anything uh, towards uh, that activity or to the unions. As a matter of fact, um, uh, us, uh, a lower percentage of French workers uh, belong to unions meaning uh, they, they pay uh, their dues and, uh, in essence, the, the, for the union's activities. Uh, what they do have, though, there is a reciprocity that whatever a union accomplishes is spread throughout the whole economy so that if um, at one refinery the union bargains a pay raise for pipe fitters, for example, it doesn't matter uh, if the, the, the locals at the other refineries uh, were doing the same thing that that increase is going to be spread throughout the, the economy because they, they have a thing about uh, they just can't wrap their, 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 their brains around the principle that a pipe fitter in, in uh, Leo will, will be paid more or less than a pipe fitter in Lyon. So, uh, you know, that's one thing they have that we don't. Um, going back to that time that our speaker was talking about and at least through the 1930s, when, when people use the term movement, you know, what do they mean? Did they mean the labor movement? Uh, did they mean the revolutionary movement? The answer is yes. In, in those days, the term labor movement was synonymous with the revolutionary movement. Uh, a, a true labor movement was considered as being revolutionary. And um, that that's still how I think. That there can't be a labor movement. I'm not talking about the way AFL-CIO does business. I'm talking about a true labor movement. And the true labor movement is equals the revolutionary movement to me. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Michael Leonard. Uh, Larry, Larry said a lot about labor leaders and martyrs and hard work, union workers, but uh, he didn't say enough about himself in that for almost the last 20 years, he's held the Labor History Society together in this state, not just in town here, 
and, and a full-time job defending the rights of public workers. It's only now that he's coming into his own because he has a little more time to, to do much more now. And in the next five or ten years, uh, Larry, I know you're going to be a force to reckon with, with all that. The ideas you've been trying to promulgate, but always have to run to the next defense of AFSCME and the next meeting. Um, but uh, Larry deserves a hand, too, as a pioneer of, of labor history. I want to give him that. But I want to tell a more personal story in that I have a friend who introduced me to Old German Waldheim Cemetery out in Forest Park. And he walked me through the legacy of all that are buried there, the, the brave souls, men and women, the martyrs. And we decided that day we visited that we would try to join them uh, by purchasing graves in the cemetery. And it was a morbid thing to talk about, but we thought, instead of pushing up daisies and looking at flowers, we could be witness to history as we saw Emma Goldman's monument there, Frank Pellegrino, which is another story related to Italian labor in this city, but great, great individuals who sacrificed for us for a decent standard of living and the union that I owe everything to in my life for a professional uh, life, a career. And so we bonded together and decided to buy plots in Waldheim Cemetery. And by the way, they are out there. There are still plots. And believe me, for under 500 I sound like I'm giving a commercial book, for less than $500, you too could be buried in a very historical grail, I think. Uh, Haymark, uh, Waldheim, and uh, Forest Home Cemetery. So then we scratched our heads. Now that we decided we want to be on that hill, what are we going to say about ourselves? And uh, Stanley said, well, I haven't done very much except to teach labor history and pass on their work to other students, young students. And I said, I sure haven't done much but be a delegate for the teachers' union uh, and advocate union democracy from uh, the uh, rank and file up. And we do have that democratic right to take down the leadership. Maybe we can't vote them up, but delegates can help take them down, Mr. Weiner. So we are democratic. Surely as democratic as the Democrat Party and their convention. And so, so we thought, we thought about being on that hill and looking down on those great men and women that we weren't worthy to be lying next to them, but apart from them, looking across at them. Fifteen seconds. The best thing we could come up with for our gravestone epitaph is. Uh, Peter Perro, uh, witness to history, that they were over there across, and the best I could do is to live the rest of my life in their vantage point, uh, okay. at their feet, Time. we say. So that's, that's my personal commentary about the great uh, cemetery, and you should all go out there and see that. It's as important as Buckingham Fountain. Okay, next speaker. Next. All right, next speaker. I'll take the next one. All right, Andy. Four minutes. Yep. I am Andy Anderson from the Northwest Information Service in Palatine. For those of you that uh, may not know me, um, our speaker mentioned several times that I've been talking about this for a decade. How is it that people in America don't know about famous things they should know about on a wide variety of issues? Well. It stems right to the concept that's talked about in Censor News. This is the 20th anniversary edition of Project Censor that came out in 1997. This year is the 41st anniversary. This is 20, 20 years of Censored News. 
Mm -hmm. They teach journalism mm -hmm. students how not to get fired and blackballed if you're going to be a journalist in America mm -hmm. because there's certain things you can't talk about mm -hmm. on radio, television, newspapers. There's a lot of taboo subjects like uh, one of them we were talking about tonight, but there's a handful that are huge, they're radioactive. If you go anywhere near them, your career is over in a heartbeat. Wow. And there's three. Uh, I have some flyers that we gave uh, students yesterday at Riverside Brookfield High School uh, where a bunch of veterans, we were over there talking to students in classrooms about, uh, my flyers are about blacked out news and game changing effects, uh, facts that military recruiters don't talk about in America. If military recruiters weren't lying to the potential recruits, nobody would be listening in the military because uh, of various things. For women, if you enlist in the military, you're going to be viewed as a sex object and a sex slave by your superiors all up and down the chain of command. If you're a man enlisting in the Army or the Marines going onto the ground to Iraq and Afghanistan, you will be living and working in a cloud of radioactive dust, like working downwind of Chernobyl. You can basically forget about having a family when you come back. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the, the three, I have a copy, a couple copies. I said there's three major radioactive stories. Number one is spelled out in Smedley Butler's book, War is a Racket. This is the updated edition with an introduction by Jesse Ventura. Anybody wants to buy one of these, uh, I've got a few extra copies tonight. We just got them yesterday. The second, second major uh, blacked out story, they form a triangle, like a, a triangle shaped bubble. The Americans are kept in a bubble of ignorance by the media. That second fact that is driving many bad things happening in America is of course the myth of 9-11. If you're inside the bubble, you still believe that we were attacked by Muslims on 9-11. If you step through the psychological barrier, get outside the bubble of media mythology, you know that seven buildings were destroyed by a demolition company on 9-11. The film, they filmed the first two and said we were attacked by crazed Muslims. 9-11 was totally done by people within the Bush administration to create a new Pearl Harbor. And of course, the third subject that is absolutely radioactive but has been well proven all over the world is described in this book with 20, there's 20 different introductions, prefaces from doctors that can, contributed to the second edition. This is the second edition. The first one was in 1998. This is called Positively False. It is false. Exposing the myths around HIV and AIDS. Now, Charlie is still inside the bubble. He yeah. has to step through the barrier to look at the evidence. <laughs> he looks Once healthy. Once you step through the barrier, you, you can do what Professor he Griffin looks said. He You need a 30% open mind and a 7th grade education. It's false. The knowledge on any of these things is easy to understand. And, of course, for those of you that can't handle it facts, the only thing you can do is attack the speaker. It's, it's called shoot the messenger. And so uh, you puncture any one of these three myths and find out that the government and the people have been lying to us. We can begin to look at other big lies that have gone unchallenged until now. All right, now. time, Andy. The only put on that topic. Time. Um, well, All right. uh, give me 20 seconds. Charlie says this is the only book on this topic. There are literally hundreds of books no. all over the world. Charlie, uh, don't keep attacking me like that. I, I, you don't have the right to do that. No. You're, you're in a bubble of ignorance. You know I, I, the, the only book since 1998, right? No, there's been a, okay. a bunch of books. This is an updated edition with the knowledge that's been accrued since 1998. Okay. The database is enormous. Your 20 like seconds are up. Let's get to our next speaker. Let's get to our next speaker. Okay, we get four minutes if you don't attack the speaker, okay? Now, Andy, Andy, you can object. It's not an attack. Well, it's Tim. absolutely right. Well, Tim, well, you know, well, you know, we are right. yeah. 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 All right, Charlie. All right, let's thank our speaker. Four minutes. Yeah. And the books, by the way, is offering a deal. All right. There's plenty of brochures there. Take some, join the, uh, the society. They have events from time to time during the year. I was at one about two weeks ago. Very nice. Um, support uh, labor history. Uh, I think we're the oldest in the United States or something like that. I'll be eclectic as usual. Uh, somebody talked about labor laws. There's only about a handful of labor laws at these classes. About, about one hand, about six of them. There really aren't. There's a lot of case law, a lot of NLRB decisions, things like that. 
not significant. That, the amazing thing is, I always amaze me some things like we're such an advanced country. Occupational safety and health was only passed in 1970. Yeah. That's how we've been. Regarding Lucy Parsons, I mean, actually I got kind of involved in that. I was messing around with the Wobblies, the IWW, and I learned that the police were objecting to this park being named. They were looking for parks to name after women. And the Chicago Police Association, their union, objected to it. Well, I took Lucy's side on the issue and arranged, uh, put out some press releases and arranged uh, to testify at the hearing at the Chicago Park District. They even was in touch with the Chicago Union, uh, the Policeman's Union, that invited them to come to the college of complexes and talk about this, debate this issue with me. He said he was busy. He had a bargaining unit of 1,000 employees. I said, I'm not busy. I got time to do it. I've got a bargaining unit of 5,000. <laughs> <laughs> the fun part of the story was I was a website guy. The website was relatively brand new, but I put together a real high tech thing, come to the public hearing. I even arranged uh, academic speakers, women's historians, uh, uh, labor, women's department people to testify. The park district called me up. They look at our website and they didn't know my trick. My trick is to let certain people inadvertently learn what you're doing. And they thought they learned secretly that we were planning what appeared to be a riot. <laughs> and they called me up and they said secretly, we are sure you were going to name this park after Lucy Parsons, <laughs> so don't cause a fucking riot. <laughs> At our park meeting, <laughs> would you kindly not? We agree with you, you know. But anyhow, at the end, we all made kissy face, and they thanked us. Actually, they thanked uh, me for generating interest in the Chicago Park. They had never seen anything like that in years. Rob May 1st, uh, we have a play that we generally put on uh, called Cell 29, which we have written here by one of the members of the college. Uh, on Bastille Day, I know that song quite well. You got that off YouTube. I send out an email celebrating Bastille Day. Le jour de, le jour de glorious they arrive. The day of glory has arrived. And if you get into the words of that song, you find out that the evil capitalists, they'll even sell you sunlight and air if they could. Uh, anarchist, anarchy is a care of cautious term. Uh, you listening there, Trump guy? Uh, they were terrorists. The police, when the government takes the side of the capitalist caste or the, the, the rich people versus the common people, as you were talking about, they said, they said, well, why the anarchy then? Forget government if it's going to take a side. Now, they have to realize that every time the workers would try to organize, the, the, they, the, the guy, big shots would call the police the National Guard think it would go out and beat them up. So would you like the government? And it isn't necessarily that they didn't like government. They just didn't like government that took sides against them and sent guys to beat the bejeebies out of them. <laughs> and last of all, I encourage you to look up something called FedVote, F-E-D-V-O-T-E. -E. And I've been doing this for the past year. Actually, it started a few years ago. But I've been keeping up on labor laws and it focuses essentially on civil service employees, and we've had some victories here recently. We started using uh, Facebook much like the Russians, and we've actually kept some anti-labor legislation from getting enacted because we're using this uh, skullduggery kind of stuff. They actually, we spent about 2,000 bucks okay. this far. Okay, time's up. All right, thank you very much, Larry. Come again All right. and buy stuff. And learn, learn so you guys need to learn, you know. I <laughs> don't know what you're talking about after. Speak for yourself, Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the one you He's just the way I I'm wondering, it used to be rough myself, why you guys have not been celebrating over the last hundred years. Because as far as I'm concerned, 
you know, we're, we're, the world's getting to be a much better place. Yeah. According to Johann Norberg and some other economists. I mean, you know, we're, 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 we're living longer. We are generally a better healthy. I'll tell you what, I'll give you some statistics and we can show, I'll, I'll show you with the data. Now, on a worldwide basis, I know there's been some anomalies, but there's still less people getting killed on a per capita basis, less people in abject poverty with about a 50% reduction since 1991. And, you know, I can prove it statistically. And the reason we don't hear much about it, like Andy says about the buried stories in the news, is because it's good news. It's hopeful. But normally what press publications do, if it bleeds, it bleeds. If you want to take a look at some of this stuff, go to Johann Norberg's website. Go look at his book about the human progress that have been made in the last hundred years or so. And I believe that the reason we have made so much progress is because we have introduced more free market capitalism and free trade around the world. Now, if you think that I'm nuts, Go again, Charlie, and look at the data. You'll find that development and that uh, prosperity comes when we have a more capitalistic and open economy. What we don't have and what stifles growth is what Adam Smith calls a mercantilist economy, where you have a bunch of people concentrating on it. But we have something called antitrust laws that will work on these things. I will be speaking a lot more about this in two weeks, about corporations that come to the public trough and get special favors, which is what I consider a form of welfare, and we don't let the capitalistic system fully flavored by allowing companies go bankrupt. To me, we've seen the biggest increase of wealth in history with the advent of the internet, the greatest communications tool around. Yes, the world has speeded up, but human nature has not. I agree with the principles of, of, of the unions because they do represent rights of workers. But at the same time, I also recognize the right for a person to go into business for himself on the respect of property rights. It's a matter of how much you want or how little you want. Generally, if you leave things more open to business with anti-capitalistic uh, and breakups of monopolies, you're going to be much better off than with what you're doing here with stifling the labor through some of the more restrictive covenants that we've been hearing about tonight. Thank you. Okay, our speaker gets the last word. One more time. Come on up and uh, answer the various uh, rebuttals that people gave. If you want. They're trying to hang my foot. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't think these would be rebuttals, but just some additional comments based on a couple of uh, comments. Uh, first, I uh, like the discussion about uh, community organizing and labor and its uh, as, as a coalition, because in fact. Uh, this goes to the heart of the issue of how people, uh, people's labor connection isn't recognized. So we think of the great community organizer Saul Linsky and where he uh, uh, owned his chops by reading John L. Lewis, the uh, founder of the Congress, CIO, the United Mine Workers president, and um, writing the biography of John L. Lewis. And so all the time that people were talking you know, about Obama being a community organizer, and then those who were trying to turn that into him being, you know, a, uh, a communist agitator or whatever, um, uh, Obama never talked about the, the roots of that being in the labor movement and the connection thereof. Um, and so uh, when we talk about Martin Luther King, we have this ability to just think about the sort of vague civil rights, uh, voting rights. But it was A. Philip Randolph who really honed. Uh, um, or help Martin Luther King understand the connection between civil rights, economic rights, and social justice. Say Philip Randolph, the uh, head of the uh, sleeping, uh, the brotherhood of sleeping car porters, the Pullman porters, and the labor movement that gave uh, 
blacks a road to the middle class and the march on Washington being organized by A. Philip Randolph, not Martin Luther King. So it's a way of sort of detracting from the labor connection and that idea that, in fact, workers' rights are really economic rights is what gives social justice uh, an opportunity. And um, uh, so I appreciated that. And also, the French connection, <laughs> uh, I actually think that in some ways France is a model of unionism and so far that, uh, while well, yeah, you're correct, they have a low um, uh, number of union members per se, the labor movement or unions have a powerful role through that social legislation. And that may be the question for America, which is that um, when we look at, we may not be uh, um, uh, we may need to be more integrated into the social network again in terms of uh, maybe it's through ballot initiatives, maybe it is. I mean, this again is unions spend a lot of time and money doing um, legislation, but perhaps it has to be looked at a little bit differently so that it is um, uh, connected to the labor movement through social legislation as um, uh, you know, much of our um, welfare benefit uh, system is. So I agree with that. Um, the other comment, because you're talking about books, uh, it reminded me, and I loved the book uh, years ago, I'm guessing it was in the 19, early 90s or late 80s, Noam Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent. What better term than Manufacturing Consent? And in the sense, dissent. that's what we've been talking about. Was it Manufacturing Dissent? Consent. C-O-N-S-E-N-T. So that, that is how we get to where we are, the way we think. And I will end maybe with this. Um, and that's so why I appreciate uh, the idea of the College of Complexes. And hopefully there is vigorous debate um, and uh, agree or disagree that we, it springs us forward in thinking about other things. And that, um, you know, in 1835, it wasn't adults and workers, uh, that the adult workers that fought for a reduction in hours of work at a silk factory. The children themselves had to walk out of this factory in New Jersey. I think it was in New Jersey. I don't know that it was Patterson. But um, uh, it was a children that were said, those who are under 11 shouldn't have to work more than a 10-hour week. So what we're saying is that we actually have to 10-hour day. Yes, 10-hour day. Thank you. Um, and that it was OK. It, Primarily, I assume, because of economic necessity and uh, wage slavery, but it was also because it was okay for children to work. It was okay for people. It's okay for women to make less than men. It's okay to have slavery. It's okay to have these things. And so it's a consciousness issue, and it's a, uh, that there was a time perhaps many of us in 1835 as adults would have assumed that it's okay for children to work. And so, I guess my only point is is that um, it, it's uh, um, uh, these changes take place because somebody stood up, somebody either resisted or somebody was not passive but active, and so it come down to it for me, which is um, Lucy Carson's saying, uh, passivity while slavery is stealing over us is a crime. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. All right, Gavin us out, Gandhi. Uh, one final note for all of you Trump watchers. Uh, this article came up on Common Dreams uh, yesterday, I think it was. It's called A Year Without the President. And it makes the case how Donald Trump is not the president. He wasn't elected. He's not governing. He's a corporate criminal masquerading as our president. And so if anybody wants uh, cards with the portal websites that publish the good news, I have a bunch of cards with these websites listed on the back. Common Dreams is at the top, the best, absolute best news site for good news, like Tim says. If it bleeds, it leads. That's all the rest of the media. That kind of stuff is not on Common Dreams. Okay, can somebody uh, have something to say? Was that you? Yeah. Who, who, who yelled out from the peanut gallery? I said right. Oh, that was you. Oh, okay. That was oh, thank you all for coming. If you want to turn to the website, just yeah, let me know. I'll be around right. here. And we'll see you next week. Thank all you. All right. Yeah. Let's cut. Oh, it's a make. It's a take. By the way, uh,